Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Chris Gilbert, as Megan said, from Dell Technologies, and I have the privilege to introducing our next panel. Uh, today we have Mr. Sonny Bag Bagawalia, Assistant Commissioner and CIO of CBP. We also have Scott Bowman that's going to be joining us, who is the uh, Deputy CIO of FEMA. Uh, and then for our monitor today, we're going to have uh, Charles Armstrong, uh, who you may have known previously as the CIO of CBP and Deputy CIO of Homeland Security. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'll uh, reiterate Luke's opening remarks. Thank you for everybody who's uh, participating here in person and out in the meta universe. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, especially a uh, big thank you to our participants, the Assistant Commissioner and CIO from Customs and Border Protection and uh, the Deputy CIO for Operations from FEMA. Uh, obviously, you know, now we're getting ready to move down into the uh, down and dirty part of uh, cloud and uh, what it takes to get there and w what things are like along the way and what bodies are left uh, afterwards. Uh, so I'm going to start off with kind of an open-ended question and, and just uh, for the assistant commissioner down there, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey so far. You've obviously been doing this cloud journey for a number of years now. So tell us a little bit about your experience so far and what, what have you uh, encountered along the way? What lessons have you learned? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, I think the first thing I learned is I started off with dark hair and now I've got gray hair. So, <laughs> so there we go. Stage. So that's uh, <laughs> one more stage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, good to see you again, uh, Charlie. And I, I think the first thing is, uh, you know, I remember I was uh, interior CIO when uh, uh, one of the former federal CIOs at the time uh, asked a question that uh, I think we have a little echo going on. Okay. So uh, at, at that time, uh, uh, Vivek was uh, sort of asking me, hey, he's got some ideas on something called cloud, federal cloud. And it was a really interesting journey. <laughs> I'm talking about 2009 timeframe. And uh, so uh, this whole thing started off with a policy that, that sort of uh, in our day job, we were, uh, you know, CIOs of the night job sort of helping out, you know, corollary duty. So I think this whole thing that he started was a really good concept and it's taken all this time to really get that adoption up to the level that we are today. Having served as a five-time CIO, I, I've just seen from the other side of it what it takes to really make things happen. And it, it takes time, you know. It's supposedly, uh, by 2025, this will be a $1.3 trillion market. But I'd say, I'd say the government adoption, which is, let's say government is about what? 80 to 100 billion uh, that we spend in federal government alone. You know, I'd say about 10, 20% is cloud now, you know? So it's not really still to the level it needs to be, but it has really taken off in the last couple of years. So uh, first things first, obviously, you know, uh, I'm an engineer and a, and a CIO by training so and experience, so I get to say what I gotta say, but this is what I've been approved to say. So, <laughs> so sometimes I'll stay, if, in case you're wondering why I'm looking at a piece of paper, it's not because I, you know, I can speak ad nauseum about the subject, but really there are some points that I think the team has prepared that and what's been approved that I want to really talk about. I think the first thing I'll just say, we operate at the speed of mission. You know, Matt talked about some mission and what you've talked about, and you've been there, Charlie, so you know that, that at the speed of mission, our operations, we're transacting 10 billion transactions a day with 40 billion data exchanges. We're processing trillions of dollars. One of our systems processes $4 trillion. We're collecting the second largest collection agency at 90, $98 billion. We're processing 1.2 million passengers, pedestrians every day. So what we got to do in this journey is make sure that it's secure and reliable and operates at the speed of mission. We're encountering 2.3 million encounters at the border. All of this stuff needs to be there. So we've got about 282 legacy apps, and I'll talk about that. And we've made tremendous progress in terms of getting at least 60% of the cloud. And I'll, you know, so, so all of this takes time, but it takes cultural change. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we're all about moving from an application level portfolio of those 282 apps to getting to an operations portfolio so that stuff just works. 
you know, so the app team with my, under my chief uh, deputy CIO and chief software officer works with the infrastructure team under the infrastructure officer and then with the CTO bringing in innovation and then working with our agents and officers, how do we innovate at the speed of mission? So there are four things that I think this journey that I have focused on, which throughout, throughout all these years, uh, I think we can only do one or four, and now I think we can do about three or four. Faster, meaning we can deploy things faster, where, for example, in Operation Allies Welcome, uh, when we had the evacuees from Af Afghanistan, we, were, we deployed in seven uh, uh, countries around the world, and at the forward end, we were deploying things. Usually I have like 40, 50 teams doing concurrent agile software development, giving two week deliveries. I was able to do that in some areas next day <laughs> on a mobile platform with facial uh, comparison. How is that possible? There is stuff on the cloud at the back end that allows us to do that, facial recognition of the technologies. Better, more resilient, and making sure that a lot of the stuff that we do is, stays up longer, is, is reliable. In some instances, for example, in one of the systems, it, we used to have potentially a five minute outage, and I think Charlie, you know what I'm talking about, you know, we're down to five minutes. We've not even had an outage, actually, touch wood. <laughs> uh, although I am getting a little something over here, but it's not cloud, it's something else. My point is, why is that? Because we have done the work, and to me, this is the other part that I want to talk about, is this is not a buzzword compliant kind of a thing. This is a lot of people doing solid work. You got to do the work to get there. And I think that's also part of the journey. You got to do the engineering, you got to have the processes. So it's people, policy, process, technology, governance. You know, you got to have all of that stuff working together. And I think it's certainly doing that. I will say the other thing is uh, stuff needs, agents need this stuff on these phones anywhere, anytime for any mission securely and reliably. So how do we make that app work so that it can be getting that information from the cloud and, and, and making sure that data is secure. We got a lot of things like Records Act, FISMA Act, you know, data. I mean, there's so many things that we have to comply with, as you know, Charlie. And, and I'm, I'm sure my colleagues will talk about that as well, is that to me, that agility is there, but that performance is really, really important. You also got to, so in addition to the faster, better, it's got to be more secure. Uh, when I came in 2018, and uh, we were having 40 million cyber attempts on us a day. Today, it's 100 million attempts a day. 40, 100. 10 billion transactions, 40 billion data exchanges, 100 million <laughs> attempts. <laughs> it's, 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 I don't know, it's, I don't know if this is, if it goes any grayer than this, but that's what it takes. So people are working really hard. I'm really proud of the team uh, as to what we're doing on that. And I think that's another message in government. There's a lot of good work being done in government by industry and government all working together to make that happen. We also have a strategy. We have a cloud strategy. We have that 60% already done. We need to get out of that data center to save money and then reinvest. And we're also doing a lot of stuff on data center optimization and also a cyber strategy and an overall strategy as to what we can do for the mission. But at the end of the day, Charlie, the bottom line is our journey to the cloud, I'm happy to report that from sort of an idea and a vision it's now a reality. It's still happening. I still think there's still a little bit of ways away, and I'll leave with you with this thought. Out of those 282 apps, we also have something called high value assets. I don't know if you've looked at that executive order that uh, the, these are the most important systems in the country that run the mission of the country. So I've got some systems that run all trade in the country, all border, all national security, you know, all travel. These are massive systems, and as you know, these you can't just move to the cloud just like that. You have to, that's why they're sitting in the data center now. We have a tier four, tier four data center. That stuff is moving last, but we want industry to help and we'll be putting some things out there to get you to work with us because it's going to take that level of engineering to make sure those work. So I'm really excited about uh, this, uh, this question. I think uh, it's very positive to see where that journey started in 2009 to where we are today. I think adoption is increasing and I think everyone's Everyone's bought into this. For example, all this collaboration that we did in COVID, during COVID, was seamless. So even though 70% of our, we are the largest law enforcement agency in the United States, at 66,000 people, everything was done seamlessly. 70% of that was working in the front lines at the 328 ports of entry and also our border patrol stations and so on and so forth, along with my staff that was there. But there's a 30% still working. All of that, remote work, telework, seamless. 
through what? Collaborative tools, where? In the cloud. So all of that has been working and now with Microsoft Teams and WebEx and all this stuff, we're able to not only communicate from anywhere, also process that information. And I think Matt talked about some of the things on TVS. Uh, all of that stuff is done with two second adjudication in the cloud. So, so all of that stuff is faster, better, more secure. And lastly, I'll say more affordable. I will not say cheaper. There's a reason I say more affordable. <laughs> more affordable is a pay-as-you-go utility that even though your outlay may be a little bit less, over time, it may be the same or a little bit over, but look at all the other benefits that you get, faster, better, and more secure. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bowman, obviously right. you've uh, got a big mission at FEMA, a very important mission uh, yes. uh, out there providing not just disaster relief, but uh, uh, grants and flood mapping and all kinds of things. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on at FEMA in terms of cloud and what you've experienced so far. So definitely a lot going on. I feel like I'm the person in the middle here. You know, back when we started the cloud journey, my hair was darker and I had more of it. I'm losing it and it's turning gray. So I'm, I'm transitioning to that final stage here. <laughs> um, so it's good that I'm sitting in the middle. Um, We've learned a lot. I would say we're about uh, almost halfway uh, through our journey, uh, not quite uh, as far along as CBP is. Uh, you know, going back to those early days uh, when Vivek, you know, issued the cloud first yeah. uh, instruction and information, you know, getting federal government to start accepting the cloud. We had some systems that went out, they kind of predated FedRAMP. Uh, and, and got out there early. Um, that was uh, the exception, not the rule. Uh, so it, it has been slow, slow going, slower than we would have liked. Um, what we've realized here recently over the past few years is that we needed more governance and structure around our migration to the cloud. So within FEMA, uh, we issued a cloud smart uh, computing directive a uh, few years ago, uh, and that's uh, to ensure that FEMA is in compliance with the OMB uh, Cloud Smart strategy uh, and going forward, uh, ensuring that we go to cloud first. Cloud is the, the first solution uh, that we look at. If it isn't possible, then that's fine. We'll, we'll go to other solutions, but uh, we need to evaluate the cloud uh, as we go forward. Um, so what we've been working on over the past few years is actually uh, standing up uh, what we call a FEMA Enterprise Cloud Environment uh, within the top three cloud service providers. Uh, so we have now established a footprint there. Uh, our customers have different requirements. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, flood insurance is very different than our grants management, which is different than our individual assistance and our uh, direct assistance uh, to disaster survivors. So uh, they have differing needs and we didn't want to limit ourselves to one cloud service provider or another. So we've actually established uh, footprints in, in multiple um, environments there. And, and, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, it's not just going and procuring the, the cloud service provider and, and standing that up. It's the security, it's the network connectivity, it's, you know, doing all of that appropriately. It's implementing zero trust as we go forward. So uh, it doesn't happen nearly as fast as we would like. I wish we were done at this point, and we are not. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into doing it and doing it right. Um, I would say the other thing at FEMA is, um, you know, we're not limiting ourselves to one solution or another. So, you know, we're looking at software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service, and, and leveraging all three platforms. Um, so as much as possible, we want to go with software as a service, low code, no code. Uh, but we are definitely, uh, for, especially for some of the legacy stuff, looking at infrastructure as a service, standing that up, and also leveraging uh, platform as a service. Uh, a few things that we've learned along the way, obviously the, the need for good contracts. Uh, you've got to be able to not only set up the uh, cloud service providers and the connectivity to them, but you've got to have the expertise uh, in-house in order to ensure that it's done correctly. Um, so that, you know, definitely contracting is a big thing, secure connectivity, uh, monitoring the cloud, setting up, um, the full logging, everything that's needed in the cloud to ensure that you've got a secure environment. Um, the other thing that we've done is uh, establish a lot of inheritable controls for our authority to operate, to streamline that process. 
uh, as we all know, the, you know, the governance and the security s seem to be what take the longest. The, the, they, they take the longest. The, the technology is easy. You could go out today and stand up a, a cloud environment and be up and running by the end of the day, but you don't have that governance and that security that's required by the federal government. Um, another thing that we learned along the way is, is the cost management and cost estimation, uh, ensuring that we stay within the bounds. Uh, as most of us know, the government operates uh, as a debit card, not a credit card. So we need to have the funding in place before we consume the resources. So ensuring that we don't overburn, overconsume uh, was critical. Uh, so that has been uh, one of our main focus areas and, and also understanding what our customers and what we are getting into as we migrate to the cloud. What we don't want to do is migrate to the cloud and find out that it costs a lot more. And so far, we, we haven't found that, um, but that's been part of the that implementation of um, our cloud group that does the analysis and the cost estimating to ensure that we know exactly what resources we need, what we're going to be consuming, and then ensuring we stay within those bounds. Uh, and you know, if something is all of a sudden going crazy and charging $1,000 an hour instead of a dollar an hour, you need to know that immediately and, and work to find out what's going on and stop that. So those are some of the things that uh, we've gone through. And like I said, we're about halfway uh, through with our cloud journey to this point. Thank you. Uh, you know, I really thought when I uh, retired from federal service, I was going to stop getting taskings from Luke McCormack. But it appears that, uh, you know, we have a question that that uh, got passed over from his group. It also kind of dovetails into what I was hoping to discuss in it. So let me ask, uh, what has been the impact on your workforce? Uh, I know, AC, you talked a little bit about what your structure is uh, within your organization. How, how has that evolved over time? And I know, uh, Mr. Bowman, you talked about the, you know, the need for a different way of doing contracting and the, the, the ramifications around that. But overall, uh, you know, what have you all done in terms of uh, looking at the workforce, uh, uh, changing things, and, and what is, what, what's your strategy there? Yep. No, we saw that uh, ball being passed to us. Uh, it was faster than the Washington Commanders, I guess, when they did the toss sweep, right? Sorry. Right. Okay, no more jokes on Washington <laughs> Commanders. Uh, all right. Uh, I think it may have uh, you want me to go first? No, or? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. So I, I think, uh, first of all, there's a lot of things here on the workforce side of it because as we're trying to be uh, deploy faster, better, more secure, more affordable, there are different skill sets that go with each of those words. But I'll add two more words to that, transparency and accountability. You know, Scott talked about accountability. You know, uh, the CFO always like, hey, the CIO is always come and ask for money and you know, there's always a sob story, you know, the dog ate my homework, it's, I didn't really do all the stuff, there's more data coming in, all, all kinds of security challenges, you know. Absolutely legit, legit reasons, but the first thing is with the workforce, I, I first try to tell them what the cloud program is, so a lot more training, uh, communications, and outreach and awareness, not only for the stakeholders first, so I've got now first with the stakeholder workforce, so the stakeholders need to know what, 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 what does cloud do for them, you know? And they have bought in through dashboards, we have done communications, I've got something called a trusted partnership initiative, where I sit down monthly to quarterly with each of the 20 stakeholders within CBP. I also sit down with all the countries. I mean, so we, we operate in 98 countries. We're also operating with the 5i countries. In fact, we're going over to meet with them. So those CIOs, we discuss what those are. Anyway, all these stakeholders need the, you know, first of all, a transparency. So show them where they are in their cloud journey and what benefits they're getting. And then the accountability which is sort of uh, like TBM concept, you know. Uh, we were lucky enough to be, the, I think, the second federal agency to get an award for TBM, but we have open dashboards that I share with everyone so that they can understand what the Amazon cost is, what this cost is, what the operational move cost is, all of that stuff. And I think what that's done, Charlie, is at least take that aspect of it and educate that workforce to be with us. On the other side of the provider, that's the consumer side of it. On the provider side of it, Everyone's concerned a little bit about their job, literally, right? It's like, hey, I used to do, you know, server huggers and all that kind of stuff, right? 
Well, they did a good, they did a great job, if you think about it. Also, these legacy, we always talk about legacy like it's a, you know, it's the car that brung you. You know, I, I drive a 1994 uh, uh, SUV. It, it's reliable as hell. It's better than the ones that I got to now, and it works, right? So some of the stuff works. So we got to just be a little bit uh, appreciative of the fact that legacy technology works. It's, it's survived this far, but cloud is better. And now how do I make that example to make sure it's not only about the technologies, but the data. We, we in the government do a really poor job of the classification of the data and how to bring that in and migrate that data correctly and then do the business continuity of that, all that. So, so I think training, giving them other things to do. For example, if you're not doing technical, most of the gov, govies are doing technical supervision, but we've got a lot of folks who are also doing technical work. So in conjunction with our uh, contractor workforce, so make it a win-win situation. Uh, give them training in terms of what cloud is, the management of the application so that they can be embedded more with the agents and officers as to what the mission is and how they can deploy faster by understanding the business process, what this cloud can do for the mission. I've got people who are embedded. For example, when they were doing the Operation Allies Welcome, we were also doing the Uniting for, U the Uniting for Ukraine. Uh, I can't talk too much about it, but I can tell you there is substantial, substantial progress that has been done in those areas. I'm talking... 100,000 people evacuated in Afghanistan, all done very quickly. The other stuff done days <laughs> with full accounting of what's coming in and out, you know, who's coming in, what level, all that stuff. It's all cloud-based. It's all cloud-based with apps. So I think app delivery, the, 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 the training, making sure that the mission is there so they understand what the mission is and then see how the solutions can be made to make that happen. The security of it. Data, right? It's all about the data. Where is that data? And so I think training in that area, defining the key roles, uh, responsibility, authority, I think that's, that's been key. We're also looking at sort of uh, stuff in terms of governance in the, sums, in, in the area of cost. This has been the biggest challenge in cloud, in my view, cost. It's very hard to look at the cost uh, looking at that. You know? So I think that training of that. And then I think just making sure that people understand that their job is no longer the technology uh, in some cases development, but more of the management, and then working together in these cross-functional teams, they can get these things done. And it's very energizing. Uniting for Ukraine, massive, massive program. For example, the Operation Allies Welcome, the largest airlift in US history. You know, we were doing this in days, fully up operational. Uniting for Ukraine, fully operational. Largest border, border surge, we're doing it right now, you know. Uh, uh, anyway, I can go on. But my point is, all of this is only possible because of people are learning. But at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, you got to give them confidence that they're here with us, learn some new skills. It's a chance for them to advance. And I'll just st st uh, stop up with this. We have got something like 58 AI projects, AI ML projects going on, 158 robotic process automation pro projects going on. These are all new things they can learn data, a new thing on data. So I think all the Gavis are very excited to learn some of these newer projects, and we need to tell them that that's how it is, and learn a little bit about cloud as well. But I think I'm really impressed with what the industry is doing in this area, and, and I think we need to team up with them to offer sort of, don't be afraid of the cloud. It's not going to be, uh, you know, automation will not take your job away. You can use this because there's plenty of jobs to do, and I, I look at it as there's plenty of work for everyone, and you know there's not enough hours in the day to do that mission. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but that to me is the workforce answer. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Bowman. Yeah, I, I would say uh, for the workforce, fear, concern. What are you doing? Why are you moving my cheese? Why are you taking yeah. my job? What am I going to do? You know, all of the emotions uh, I think are the initial reaction to that. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, once, you know, we sit down with the team and, and understand, you know, the, the big thing with them was communicating with them, making sure they understand what we're doing, when we're doing it, how we're doing it, why we're doing it. Um, and also ensuring that they have the training that they need to be successful as we go forward. You know, we're still working on that. Uh, we're about halfway through. And I think one of the things that they, they've really started to realize as we're going through the process is, a lot of what we have on-prem, you know, the legacy environment, uh, as Sonny said, it's the car that brung you. Well, I mean, a lot of that's virtualized today. They do that remotely. They're not coming into the office every day and touching the server or touching the storage area network. So a lot of those things 
they weren't doing day to day anyway. Um, and, and you really, the cloud, it's someone else's servers, it's someone else's data center. So yeah. the things that we're doing virtually in our data center are very similar to what we're doing in the cloud and the different cloud service providers. Uh, we're doing it remotely. So as we've gotten into it and learned more, it isn't as big of a change as they thought it was going to be. So there's there's less fear the more that they've learned. Yeah. Could I just add one thing on that? Sure. I think in our culture in America, too often we are like, yeah, it's old, it's legacy, shaming, oh, you know that. <laughs> Actually, it's more genius. I, when I went to the BCI of Hawaii, I found that they had a VAX computer working for 40 years. I called the guy and gave him an award, but then I told him we got to go to the cloud. But but, <laughs> but, 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 but I embraced the guys, like, you are a genius for keeping this thing, how long? A PDP, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Right. Mm -hmm. He was buying stuff on eBay and making stuff work, you know, but I, and then he can easily learn the cloud, it's nothing. So we got to change this culture of, yeah, it's old and everything new is shiny and great. It's, it's not, there's a lot of other challenges. So you got you to gotta do that. And I think to Scott's great point of also about the fact that once we, they learn all this stuff, I tell you what's exciting is when you, when you give them, you're part of the mission. The operation allies welcome when we recognize the team. A lot of them were in tears because it represents the greatest values of America. Mm -hmm. We honored our commitment, you know, and we helped somebody. I mean, you know, you could see that mission happening. So when they're involved in that mission, it's not about servers and cloud, it becomes something else. And I think that is where this is going. So it becomes a service that works. Now, I will say with industry, we need to make sure the stuff stays up, but that's what so far. We've only had one or two things here and there, but overall, it's gone much, much better. There are two or three more sigmas of reliability that we've gained. And I think people are gaining more, instead of previously it was like my jobs, I think they're learning more like, hey, how can this be used for this mission or this project that you're doing? And they can like, oh my goodness, I can serve that mission faster and better. So let me go there. Yeah. And, and one of the things I've communicated to, to my team and you know the, the various folks throughout FEMA is we didn't become IT people and, and technology people to do the same thing every single day, year after year after year. We, we did stuff. this to learn new stuff. Yeah, you exactly. know, technology is evolving continually. Uh, so you know, rise to that challenge, learn new stuff. It, it's not scary. And once they get into it, they, they are accepting it and, and willing to learn new things and move off of some of the, the legacy solutions that we have implemented. I already went off script, by the way. So the, the VAX example is just an example, all right? That's my own personal one. That was not in the script. So you're not running a VAX? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool back in the day. It's very reliable. So AC, you talked a little bit about um, um, new functionality that you're delivering in yep. cloud. Uh, have you done any modernization of old stuff while you've been migrating? I mean, uh, or has it just pretty much been uh, a replatforming or what, what? I mean, no, in some cases, no. The answer is in some cases it's completely new. Uh, in some cases I got to change, like for example, the ACE collections. Uh, we were the first agency in DHS to get the TMF funds and, you know, for maze collection. So we actually also updated the COBOL code <laughs> and also we use mainframe as a service in the cloud. We were the, one of the first agencies to do that as well. So that's good, but still a mainframe, right? It's as a service, in, but kind of quasi-cloud with stuff going on. I won't name the vendor, you know, but, but it works. So, hey, I, I'm not nothing against that mainframes work. It's fine. But eventually, I'd like to go completely cloud. Sure. I think the leap replatform, all of that stuff, we are getting more visibility by talking to these vendors and finding out exactly what the architecture is. When I was Treasury CIO, I, I, I remember I won't talk to the name of the company. I found out that we had a more in-depth, deep dive into where their stuff was was traversing, and these these the vendor industry was really amazed. Why am I asking these detailed questions? The reason is we are all held accountable to statutory laws that have penalties associated with that. If there is a breach of data or, or something like that, we are held liable. So I want to make sure that through the entire transit, there's confidentiality, right? You know, right? And availability and all the other good stuff that goes with it. So I, I, anyway, so all of that stuff is really, really important. So I think the answer is in some cases, Replatform, but a lot of new cases are completely new. And at the end of the day, cloud is what? 
it's application platform and infrastructure, you know? Mm -hmm. So I got to have all the things going. We have networking going with EIS and upgrading all of that to 5G and other, and now they're even talking about 6G before we're even doing 5G yet, right? And a lot of times they say 5G, but it's 5GE, which means it's not exactly 5G. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's quasi 5G. So we're looking at all these technologies, a lot of stuff going on in AI ML, uh, NLP, natural language processing, a lot of stuff going on in robotic process automation, a lot of Silicon Valley innovation that we're bringing in with through Schedule 880 innovation. We're also working with, uh, I guess we can say this is uh, CIA and QTEL kind of innovation that's coming in. So all of that stuff working is bringing some exciting technologies that are bring com, you know, coming in. But I'm keeping stuff going because, first of all, I got to keep the lights on and operations working, number one. And I'm happy to report that is going really well because I focused on that. I focused on a lot of good things you built. And so just keeping that going. So that is working really well. And so thank you for making sure that all that foundation was there. So that's working well. But now I can, with newer technology available from industry, I can sort of, you know, shift things out, so to speak, and bring things in. Privacy records is still a big issue for us. Uh, I will say data is the next big frontier. I'm going to be hiring a data a chief data officer very soon. Data is the next thing. We're dealing in petabytes of information. Uh, I think making sure this stuff is available so that I can use data analytics on the fly. I can do on the fly data visualization. All of that stuff is the future that I see is coming. Uh, and I think the cloud will enable that. I think mobility with the cloud, making that stuff happen with new technologies like facial recognition with uh, and facial comparison, also more security, all of that stuff will be the future in my view. Mr. Bowman, uh, yes. could you uh, elaborate on that question a little bit? Yeah, so as, you know, as far as uh, you know, migrations, rehosting, lift and shift, modernization, what are we doing? But all of the above, uh, I think many Organizations are in a, a similar situation where um, you have a lot of, uh, you know, legacy. And again, legacy is not a bad word, but we have a lot of legacy applications, um, you know, within FEMA. Uh, you know, I like to say, uh, you know, as a software developer, applications should not be old enough to drink. But we've got several applications that are over 21 years old, so they are old enough to drink. Um, so initially, um, the plan was to modernize those as we go forward. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, major enterprise modernization initiatives, our you know, financial systems modernization, our grants management modernization. And the thought was that these solutions would take over a, a lot of these legacy apps. Um, and what we're seeing is there's been some delays there. So now we have legacy apps that are running another lifecycle iteration longer than we thought they were going to. Uh, so we're actually doing something that two years ago we said we would never do, that we were not going to do, absolutely weren't going to do it, and that's basically rehosting or or lift and shift, if you will, uh, picking up uh, some of these legacy applications and moving them as is with very little refactoring, very little change, and putting them in the cloud. Um, some of the reasons for doing that are um, these lifecycle iterations, buying the on-prem hardware, paying the on-prem cooling costs and power costs get to be very expensive. Um, specifically for FEMA, one of the things we have is we have to be able to support the maximum maximum for disasters. Uh, how, how big is the next disaster going to be? And without knowing that, I've got to have the hardware and software on-prem to support it today. So the scalability of the cloud and being able to move to the cloud, so with our individual assistance registrations, they may take a few hundred registrations a day on a normal day and then a large hurricane hits or something like that, and we could be taking 100,000 registrations a day every day for weeks on end, similar to what we did in the 2017 hurricane season. So by moving some of these things to the cloud, it will allow us to run on a smaller footprint, less hardware, less software day to day, and then surge as needed. So that scalability of the cloud is, is a big plus for us, even running legacy applications in the cloud. Yeah, yeah if I could just add one thing. Uh, Two quick examples, just one or two minutes here. Uh, first is ACE portal, that same system that processes the, you know, one, you know, like I said, four trillion. So, you know, 2.7 in, in imports, 1.6 in exports, million, trillion. That system, we have now come up with a portal that allows first to modernize, so there's CX. What used to be, you know, is now customer experience, right? What you citizen experience, not customer experience. That whole thing is completely modern. 
along with multi-factor authentication. So it's something you know and something you have. Along with that, so we have looked at almost 60,000 users, trade users, and various communities, and they're having that experience. So now we've got to attest them, attest, uh, attest them and validate, make sure they're who they are. So identity management has become really, really key. Mm-hmm. I've also migrated SAP completely to the cloud. You know, so who are the two things? Who are the two people you got to keep happy in an organization? Uh, your boss and the CFO, right? So, so SAP is migrated to the cloud they're seeing like, oh, wow, this is really working. So now I can have a different conversation as to how this cloud can benefit them and with the other stakeholders. So I think, Charlie, you know, this has been key. And I I hope, I think Scott would agree with me is this conversation is enabling CIOs to get more street creds. And we are absolutely being able to show that, hey, we're doing this together. Full transparency, you can see the dashboards. In fact, it's becoming so transparent, they're like, yeah, I got too many dashboards, okay, I'm, I'm good. No, 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 I got more. No, 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 I'm good. No, 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 please. So my point is, and you know that's a big change for CIOs, right? And previously, like, yeah, I think you're hiding something from me. They're not. We are absolutely moving that forward. So I think that is really a new conversation. Great. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, We have a few minutes left, so I did want to just get to some of the questions from our virtual audience. And as a reminder for the folks in person, we, of course, are taking your questions. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about a couple that you might want to ask. Um, But we did get a great question from someone. Um, They were asking, with so many government agencies moving to cloud, how integrated are they? And for example, is it easy for CBP users to share data with DOD or vice versa? Hmm. And does data have to be passed between users, or is it cross-cloud access enabled? And I don't know if there's even some anecdotes between uh, CBP and FEMA you might be able to share. Well, uh, so first of all, Operation Allies, welcome. We got the notice. And the next day, everyone's scrambling, trying to figure out how we make this thing happen. We had DOD, obviously DHS, all the agencies here. We had State Department and others all working together. How do we solve this problem? And data sharing was intrinsically a part of that. Well, all things said uh, said and done, we have to make sure we can vet the folks who are coming in. Who are they? Some of them are running from uh, persecution, you know, and they literally had to burn documents. Otherwise, they may not have survived. Mm -hmm. How do I still make that happen? Well, guess what? CBP already had some groundbreaking technology that we have a global ecosystem already working. Mm -hmm. We've processed 500 million people over the last four years, whatever, if you take a look at it. Successfully at 99.5 to 99.8 percent, you know, uh, uh, efficiency within uh, that two-second adjudication stuff I'm talking about with additional vetting on the high side. We use an ATS uh, global uh, facial mm-hmm. with the mobile. We gave it to DOD. They were able to, anyone could just take that information, send it in. We did all the vetting on this side and checked all that information coming in and out to the point that uh, I'll just say that DOD was like blown away. Who was, who, who's got this technology? It was, it was DHS, it was us. And so that's one example. I, and other, another example is an immigration journey. You know, we have unified immigration portal and, uh, and now we have HHS, DHS, all the components within uh, DHS and now DOJ coming in, so how we can integrate that journey with the unified immigration portal. My point is these things are happening. Do we have everything yet? No, absolutely not. There's a long journey ahead in terms of why is that? I think what people need to appreciate is that there are a lot of statutory and statutes that we have to comply with. And it's not as easy just to kind of poo-poo that. These are real, these laws and legal things are making it more difficult. We can easily do this, but we got to get the policy that goes with that. So sometimes technology gets in front of policy and that's a problem, right? And so that whole thing needs to be changed. But the answer to your question is absolutely. And working with, for example, FEMA, they're tracking Fiona at the moment. Uh, you know, FEMA is obviously the main agency that goes forward. We track it in terms of what's happening on our side. And uh, so I think this is going to be a growth area for information sharing in the cloud. I don't know, Scott. I t- totally agree. I, I think the technology is there and it's a, a possibility and capability that, that exists. And we have that set up with a lot of our partners uh, already. Uh, but, you know, having to do it on the fly, you know, your statements of records notification, your data sharing agreements, there's a lot of process, governance, policy and laws that go into who you can share data with, how you can share the data. Um, so having those things adapt to the speed of the cloud, uh, we're not there yet, uh, but it is improving and getting better. And, and by the way, the only reason why all this works is when you have a common mission. When stuff is happening and 
all these things are coming at you and everyone wants to work together, it really, it, it's really amazing what we can do. And I think the government's doing a heck of a good job, actually, thanks to industry as well who are supporting us. Right. No, those are both great answers and really help to clarify that point. And I think we do have an audience question. Hi, I'm Fatma Akhtar, and I had a question around um, climate and sustainability. So as we move to the cloud, and it's one of the strategic elements of um, FEMA's strategic plan is to make sure that we are, you know, we're taking climate change into consideration. So what are you all doing as we move to the cloud and to operate more effectively in the cloud in regards to climate and sustainability? Yeah. One thing that I would say is just the... Uh, the move to the cloud and decreasing the on-prem data centers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues with FEMA and having to have that almost unlimited scalability on-prem means that I'm running that every day. So that, that right there in and of itself is taking into account a lot of uh, power, a lot of cooling. So, you know, just moving to the cloud will help, uh, you know, climate change from that perspective. We're going to con consume less power, less air conditioning, things like that as we go forward. Um, also, uh, leveraging um, collaboration tools in the cloud, uh, cutting down on greenhouse gas emissions as uh, we, we don't have to travel as much. We're teleworking a lot more. We can work with our partners so they, we don't have to drive from one office to another office. You know, that, that's another area. Um, looking at a, a electrifying uh, our, our fleet internally. You know, there, there's a lot of things going on uh, within FEMA. Uh, related to climate change, and, and those are some of the things uh, within the, the mission support area that we're looking at. Um, also ensuring that uh, we have the ability, you know, with the data center, you've got failover capability. So if we were to have issues on the East Coast, we can fail over to the West Coast, and we don't have outages like we used to in the past. So if, you know, if we're running in a California data center and they lose power or have a brownout, we could transfer to the East Coast uh, and, and run there. So uh, there, there are some flexibilities that we gain with moving to the cloud as well. Yeah, I'll just say that uh, uh, obviously uh, when this journey started, uh, what's little was not known as well, but there was a report that Vivek started before he did the policy, and that study is what we did at the time, was how many servers there are in the government and what was the PUE and efficiency ratings of this, right? And then he came up with the first policy, which was 40% reduction of servers at the time by a certain date. And then also the PUE efficiency. That PUE was never really investigated more, but as we go to leads-based data centers and all these green data centers and emissions and all that kind of stuff, that is one measure. Now, what has not been corroborated or correlated is what happens with that number in the data center vice what's in the cloud and how much stuff you're comparing. So I don't know if anyone's done a study on that. That's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that question, but I would submit to you, I think it's probably we have saved, you know, we are doing better. We are certainly doing better in terms of the number of servers and data centers that we cut. So I think from that standpoint, both those are positive things. In addition to the fact that there is now more focus on a green approach. So we have a green trade strategy, we're doing sustainability, but not at the cost of just like, coming up with some fictional technology that doesn't work. I mean, you know, we, stuff has got to work. When I need 100 amps, I need 100 amps now. <laughs> I need 100 amps to work, you know, and, and so I think if that's the case, if solar and others can give me that continuously with all the other things that I have to do with Six Sigma level availability for a tier four data center, the answer is absolutely we're looking for that. And I think that carbon footprint is going down. I drive an electric vehicle, by the way, but I do have an SUV too. So I, I said that earlier. I like my SCP too, and you know, so I balance it out. So. Sure. And Charlie, I think I will turn it over to you for any final thoughts from your panelists or any final questions you might have. Uh, just like in a nutshell, um, what, what would you like to see out of industry going forward? Uh, and, and I always think back, Sonny, when I was in your job, you know, the big challenge we had around moving between data centers was the ability to have yeah. the, the bandwidth to move the volumes of data back and forth, yeah. right? A lot of that's gotten solved over the past few years, but not not without a lot of, you know, be, beating of knuckles and uh, talking to folks and, and, you know, adopting new methodologies that allow us to scale up those pipes and scale down those pipes. 
and I just use that as a frame of reference. What, so what are those types of things, you know, that, that are kind of top of mind for you all that you would like to see industry really hit hard on to make your life easier? Yeah, so I, I look at industry from two stand, standpoints. I've been in industry in a Fortune 30 company, uh, sort of served there, so I know what that value proposition is, having served also in the government. I think first things first, we're in this together, and what are the services that you can do for the mission? I think it energizes people. It's not just about money. It's about mission. People love that stuff. When they see that they do something that's, that is value added, it's something. So I think that, that's one. I'd like to see more enterprise service catalogs of services that's available with clear definitions. It's almost like uh, you know, clear uh, uh, accounting of what's, what comes with it. <laughs> so I know absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt, like a blockchain or something. You know, I know what's in there. You know. So that, that would be a second thing. I think automation, uh, I, if that's all, all automated and works and it provides me as a service, I'm, I'm happy with that. If it's platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, whatever that is, I'm good with it. I think standardization, uh, there was a question earlier about how does CVP work with industry on the biometric entry exit, handling all these hundreds of millions of passengers. The answer is, this is the, the reason why that's genius of system is that it's not a government managed system. We have just put the standards out there. And so we do our part of it. And then the, and then the industry meets us at those standards. And then we process that. So that's an incredible government industry partnership. So I think something like that, I think is gonna be the future as we're getting to these new worlds uh, of, of stuff that's going on. I like to see more innovation come in. Uh, one of the things that reason why these RPA and AI ML and all these projects and innovation projects are so successful, I've got 136 in, in, uh, innovation projects run by the commissioner's office. My CTO is just a, is supporting that, but I'm not the lead on it. Even on the RPA and the AI ML projects, I have taught them how to fish. Anyone in, in our stakeholders can do the job. They just have to register with me. They know how to use some of the tools. I help them with consulting if they need be. I'd like industry to provide those services. There's plenty of room for everyone. There's plenty. We're talking, you know, we have a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar budget. There's a lot of opportunity to bring this in, and this is what excites people. So I think, I think that innovation and excitement is, I feel like, is, is the perfect mix that needs to come in. I'd also talk about the G word, governance. It's a word that people don't understand, and they don't. Governance could be anything from uh, configuration management and engineering level lifecycle on CI, CD pipelines, all the way up to governance of data, governance of ethics in AI, ML using cloud. So I think all of these services we are, uh, we are going to be uh, you know, putting out there, uh, we are going to just put out the enterprise small business contract. So small business, we are putting more, more of that. So stay tuned, it's just going to be announced. Uh, and, or maybe I announced it, uh, uh, there's, uh, we actually we have done that, it's the RFI is already out there, so that's, that's gonna be one. Uh, ECIS is a cloud-based uh, uh, service that we're looking for and we want people to help us, that's another one. We're already working on EIS uh, right now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's coming out, innovation, there's gonna be some stuff on innovation, there's stuff on data. So I think all these things from industry, I'm looking for industry just bring qualified people, don't give me labor categories that are like, you know, $7,000 a, you know, what an hour or whatever. Just give me some categories of folks where, you know, a lot of people, it's not just money, they come in, they love the work. I've got people who are working with me right now. They can easily triple their salary, even in, even in industry, triple that, but they love the work. So I think there's a good balance there. So a lot of good work to do, transparency in the government, we can do better. They can participate with us. I think, I think there's a bright horizon ahead. And so I think, I just think a lot of positivity up ahead for us. Mr. Brilliant. Uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, continue with the, uh, the reliability and the availability, you know, we'll knock on wood. Uh, it's been pretty good, but uh, even uh, large cloud service providers are not immune to an outage every once in a while. Yes. So <laughs> as we move these critical services uh, to the cloud, you know, please, you know, keep everything up and running and operational. Um, you know, a financial model that, that works better with the government, uh, you know, that's been one of our big challenges yes. is making sure we've got that financial model in place that works well with the way the government works. You know, in the government, uh, 
If you want money, you should have asked for it two or three years ago. Uh, so that's a challenge. It's difficult to get to get money right now, today or tomorrow. Uh, so as you introduce new technologies, we may want to invest and move forward in that, but it takes planning and time. So, you know, we're, we're trying to put things in place so that we're ready to modernize. Um, you know, moving forward, uh, the machine learning, uh, you know, RPA, we're, we're definitely uh, going in those directions. And our customers are helping drive those directions because they have the requirements. And I, I totally agree with what you said, Sonny. Teach them the fish. Let them start doing this. As we get more into low code and no code, um, how can we empower our, you know, not just the, the technical IT people, but our, our users and our business users to do it themselves so that they can be the ones out there and you know it becomes a force multiplier when they're able to do these things and automate their own processes again there's governance there's security there's management that we have to have those controls and that overlay but it's exponential when we can get them to do those things on their own yeah if i could just say one thing the supply chain security watch out for supply chain security y'all are just as targeted as we are <laughs> Don't be fooled, the insider threat, the external threat, the level of sophistication of what they're doing with uh, zero, zero day attacks, log 4J, level 10 out of 10 security problem. I see industry, I deal with industry and I can tell you, sometimes people think, well, government is not far ahead. Government is way ahead in some areas, but it doesn't really help me. If I'm ahead or you're ahead, it doesn't really matter. If we are connected, we both need to be ahead together. <laughs> so I look at it as, this is an America problem. We are all, you know, here in America. We're serving the U.S. government. We're serving the United States of America. Get it done. Let's go and talk to each other and figure that out on cyber. So cybersecurity supply chain is a big area of, of concern for us. And I think, uh, as you mentioned, the accountability, uh, fixed price, cost plus. I know, you know, a lot of challenges here, but if you have some other ideas, give us those ideas as to how we can do better because acquisition, agile acquisition is still a, is still a, 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 I guess, a hope for us. So we'll just leave it at that. The, the, the agile acquisition, the agile cybersecurity, it's, you know, that we have agile programming, but the, the other parts of it haven't quite caught up. And um, another thing, uh, FedRAMP, uh, you know, making sure that everyone knows what, what comes with the FedRAMP approved environment and what doesn't. Uh, we've had a lot of vendors tell us, oh, you can do this and you can do that. And then you find out that, well, you can't do that in FedRAMP or that service isn't available in FedRAMP. So just ensuring that uh, everyone knows uh, what, which environments we're talking about. Yeah. Great. Well, if I could ask the audience to give us a big round of applause for these two great yeah. servants and to the U.S. Thank you for coming. Thank you yeah, very much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Ar